Morning folks, I'm Dave Canterbury with Self-Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School. And what I want to talk to you today about is a concept that I'm going to call evolution for survival. And I think that being able to evolve in everything that we do drastically affects our ability to survive in the future, to become more self-reliant. And to me, the definition of survival boils down to a very simple concept of being able to adapt to changes within your environment quickly. If you can quickly adapt to environmental changes, you can survive. If you can't do that, you will not survive. And that is what killed out the Neanderthal, as far as scientific research that I've read has shown. Their inability to adapt to an immediate changing environment or a quickly changing environment. So let me give you an example real quick of a tool. This is a takedown buck saw. But this is not just an ordinary takedown buck saw. This is actually a takedown turning buck saw. And for the people who know about woodworking tools, a turning saw is a saw that's been used probably since the 15th, 16th century to be able to cut curves in wood, whether that be a rip cut or a cross cut or a combination of the two, being able to cut curved lines with a saw was accomplished with a frame saw called a turning saw. The buck saw is not a new concept. The frame saw is not a new concept. And a buck saw is nothing more than a saw used for taking large pieces of lumber and bucking them or cutting them down to manageable pieces. That is the definition really of a bucking saw. So this is, for all intents and purposes, a buck saw, but it is a turning buck saw. And because it's a turning buck saw, it is very adaptable to what it needs to do. It can not only buck wood, but I can also use this tool to cut horizontally while holding the saw straight up and down. I can cut horizontal with it because the blade will actually turn within the saw on these pivot points. So I can turn this blade completely 90 degrees on this saw and cut sideways with it while it's still up and down. It will turn within an axis so that it can cut curved lines and the blade can manipulate itself to an arc or a curve while the frame itself is straight up and down. So it's a very adaptable saw and it's an evolution, in my opinion, of the takedown buck saw. It's something that I saw in a book on how to make carpentry tools and I thought, you know what? If a takedown buck saw had the attributes of a turning saw and it had a dry wood bucking saw blade in it, how awesome would that be for a woods tool? It's not that much more complicated. It's not that much more difficult to build. It does take another saw to initially build it like a folding saw. It does take the ability to drill holes like with an awl but other than that, a couple of nails and a file or the ability to be able to cut a blade down a little bit to fit inside here, inside this radius, is really all you need to be able to make this saw even in the woods on the fly, although this one's made from milled down dimensional lumber because it's a working model that I made to see if the concept itself would work and it works fantastic. So that is an evolution of that saw. But I would never have even thought of that or conceptualized that had I not immersed myself in an environment of doing woodworking tasks around my homestead. So the immersion training of woodworking has let me evolve into figuring out tools that may better suit my immediate or medium or long-term survival or self-reliance even within a woodland environment. Okay, we've got the whiteboard out here in, in the classroom today because I want to show you something that's interesting. And again, it comes with immersion training and evolving over time and understanding that so many things are interrelated. And I want to show you something real quick. When we work stone, so let's go back to, all the way back to making tools from stone. What we do is we take a piece of stone, and this is, the, this is looking at the stone from above. All right, this is our piece of rock, and we're looking at it from above. And we have valleys, and we have a peak. And that peak 
on that peak we abrade to create a platform and we drive a flake off of that piece and when we do that what we get is something that looks let me wipe this off of my shirt real quick I didn't bring a rag what we get is we have a piece of stone here that now has a flake driven out of it that's created two more peaks with valleys on both sides and now if we create platforms here we'll drive these flakes out like on a blade core so that creating of peaks and platforms and removing the peaks or peaks and valleys excuse me that removing of peaks to create two more peaks and another valley is exactly the same process that you use for working wood or you use for working metal when you're using hand tools because I apologize that my rag kind of sucks here, but if you look at a piece of wood, let's say that we have a bowl that we're working on from a piece of material. What we're going to do is we're going to drive our gouge into that bowl and it's going to create a valley. And on the other side of that valley, there's going to be two peaks. We're going to take our gouge and we're going to remove this peak and it's going to create a valley here with another peak. And then we're going to remove that peak and it's going to create a valley here. Remove that peak and create another valley here, all the way around that bowl. And it's exactly the same thing if this bowl were a preform made of stone. So now forget that this egg shape right here is a bowl and think of this as a preform piece of flint that we're going to remove a flake off of. And when we do, it creates this. And our next flake is going to come from here and create this, and our next flake is going to come from here and create this, and it's all about creating peaks and valleys and removing the peaks to reduce or manipulate the material. It's no different. With metal, it is almost the same, except instead of removing material, you are moving material. So if I have a piece of metal stock here, and I hit it with the ball peen portion of my hammer, a rounding hammer, or some type of a cross peen hammer, or on my anvil to fuller the piece. What I do is I hit it here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and that creates this bar, makes this bar move this direction and this direction. And then I'll come back in and I'll pound this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this flat, and that will further lengthen the piece. So all I've done is I have created peaks and valleys and flattened out the peaks to manipulate that material where I want it to go. If I'm going to take a piece of, let's say I have a piece of square stock and I want to make a point on it, I want to make it round. I start off with the square by pounding down the peaks and as I pound those peaks down I create more facets and as I pound those facets down, I create smaller facets until eventually I have something that's round and it draws out to a point. It's no different whether it's stone, wood, or metal. They're all manipulated with the same basic concept of peaks and valleys. And understanding this, the revelation of understanding this basic concept comes from only one thing immersion training. Doing it so often and so much that you can't do it wrong. So when I learn to make something, I want to make it until I can't make it wrong. If I'm going to make spoons, I'm going to make spoons every day until I can just do it without thinking about it. It becomes muscle memory. I understand how to work the structures in the grain. I know which types of wood are the best. I know which types of wood are the worst. I know how much I can let the wood dry out before it's going to crack. Exactly how to cut that piece of wood so that I can avoid the cracks or checking of the wood as it dries. All of those things are important. You can't learn those things by one spoon. You can't learn those things by making one net needle or one bowl. You have to make lots of them from different materials. So going back to the survival type videos, there's only so many ways you can make fire. I am fully confident that I can walk out into this woods right now 
and make a fire even in damp weather conditions. And if I had to do it by friction, I could do it. But I'm going to have a lighter in my pocket because I'm going to be prepared. But I've done enough starting of fires by primitive means in the eastern woodlands in my environment that even with environmental changes in weather, I'm confident that I can still affect a task if needed. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to learn lots of other things. And those other things all boil right back down to your ability to adapt to environmental changes. If I don't have power tomorrow, can I make the tools, the metal tools that I'm going to need to manipulate the wood? Because I need the wood to bend the metal because I need the charcoal. But I also need the metal to manipulate the wood because knives, axes, chisels, gouges, all those things make manipulating the wood to a shape or an object much, much easier. So understanding the basis of woodworking, the basis of metalworking is very, very important. I'm perfectly confident that I can go out and set a dozen traps and catch enough animals to sustain me or feed me. I haven't really been wasting my time putting up a lot of trapping videos this year, although I do have some traps out, because it's redundant information to you. Because I've caught almost every animal there is to catch in Ohio, and I've already put it on film, and I've already talked about how to set these traps in 50 plus videos. I've got 30 plus videos on making fire. I've probably got two or 300 videos on different basic survival techniques. So now I'm concentrating on other things so that I can evolve in my self-reliance. And I wanted you to understand that, but I also wanted you to see a couple of examples of what I'm talking about as far as that evolution of mentality and that evolution of survival. Okay, guys, well, I'm Dave Canterbury with the Pathfinder School of Self-Reliance Outfitters, and I didn't want to drag this talking head type video out for a long period of time. I just wanted to convey to you some things that I've been thinking about lately and some of the reasons for the long series of videos because I started my YouTube channel as a learning experience. I'm learning with you. I'm showing you what I'm learning. I'm teaching you things that I've already learned. And I'm also getting feedback from the viewers that helps teach me other things and helps me evolve and adapt in my learning. And because of that, you have a long series of videos like the trapping series, like the Journal of the Yurt, like the blacksmithing series, like the woodworking, green woodworking series because I'm going to do that stuff until it becomes second nature, until there's no question in my mind that there's no tool I might need that I can't make with metal or wood, and there's nothing that I may need to build out of wood that I can't build if I have to, to include the most simple tools like this takedown turning buck saw. I appreciate your views, I appreciate your support. I thank you for everything you do for our school, for our business, for our family, for all of our sponsors, instructors, affiliates, and friends, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.